if you are new, you picked a great Sunday to join us. We're at the beginning of a series, about an eight-week series that'll take us up into the end of the year on the book of Malachi. Uh, if you are with us last week, we took a break uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, we will pick up the book of Luke again. Uh, I, I could not stop, and we have to finish Luke because I will have heart palpitations if we don't. Finish what you start. But uh, I thought this would be a good uh, break in where we are in the book of Luke and a way for us to lead into uh, the holidays. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab it, open it up with that uh, first, with that first, uh, that first lesson there in the book of Malachi. And we'll take a look at this here together. Malachi is where we're going to be. If you can't find it in your Bible, find Matthew in the New Testament. Go back one book and you'll land in the book of Malachi. Um, when you tackle, Malachi is the end of your Old Testament, duh. And uh, it's in there in the, what the, um, the Hebrews would have called the Twelve. It's the capstone of the, of the prophets. It's the final word of God to his people. And it closes your Old Testament. And then if you know how your Bible is put together, there's about 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Uh, and the book of Malachi uh, is written, I'll give you just some, some time stamps which will help you. You don't get a lot of uh, what is happening in the book of Malachi culturally. You really have just hints at what, at what is going on uh, because of where Malachi falls. Malachi writes after both Haggai and Zechariah, both of whom write during uh, the restoration period of God's people who have come out of exile, out of both Babylonian and then ultimately Persian captivity to come back into their land. They come back into their land because of the ministry of very key leaders, men called Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah, who rebuild the people in their restoration to their land, who rebuild the altar and the temple, their cultic center of worship, and then in Nehemiah and his ministry as he rebuilds the wall. So Malachi writes about 80 to 90 to maybe 100 years after Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai and Zechariah are written to encourage the people who are back in the land and who have kind of fallen off in their ambition to rebuild and restore. Uh, God's people back in their place with the temple and the, the worship going on and then the security of their, of their um, city in Jerusalem by rebuilding the wall. So Malachi writes and he gives you some themes that you'll kind of see uh, similarly show up in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, so Malachi, like I said, about 5th century B.C., about 400 years behind, um, before John the Baptist and Jesus. Uh, and when Malachi writes, he writes to a people who are now back in the land. They've heard God's promises through Haggai and Zechariah, but their passion for the Lord has fallen off. Uh, they've gotten either distracted or discouraged. Uh, they've, they now kind of face a time in the nation's history to where things are not as good as they have been. Not all of the Jews have even returned from captivity. And Malachi writes to address a lot of the heart issues that are going on in these people. And you'll see as we work through this book the way Malachi does that. Malachi does it in a very unique way. He does it in a way where he addresses the heart concerns of the people and enters into dialogue with them. As such, uh, Malachi is filled with um, kind of arguments or disputations between God and his people. It's God having a conversation with people who are questioning his love and God in who in turn is confronting some of the challenges they face of heartless worship, of their marriages that are a mess, of their inability to really worship God the way he's meant to. The priests don't obey and teach the people the way they need to. And it, God kind of sends sends Malachi into these conversations with these people to remind them of his character, to confront them in their sin, and ultimately to point their hope toward God who has been faithful, who is faithful, and God who will be faithful into the future. So the, the subtext to this, or the kind of the subtitle to this series is apathy, which really lives in the hearts and minds of these people. Arguments, which characterizes the conversation between God and the, his people of about 50 of the verses 
all together in this book, I think something like 45 of them are God's direct address and conversation to these people. So the book is filled with what God thinks, which is a very good book to read. And then ultimately the book ends with a note of incredible anticipation, which will take us up into Christmas and prepare our hearts for the Christmas season. So... This week, where we're going to start in the book of Malachi is with the first dispute, the first uh, argument. Um, And this argument is over the love of God. Um, For many of us who are Christians, uh, our experience and um, confidence in the love of God has a tendency to wax and wane, doesn't it? We, we wrestle in our relationship with God about his love for us. In fact, one of the maybe the ultimately greatest root issues for all of us is to recognize and to affirm God's faithfulness in the past, his faithfulness in the presence, and his faithfulness into the future. And you will see even in the songs that we sung this morning, they all had a thread of how faithful God has been been to his people. So this morning, what we're going to do is is begin the first conversation that God has with these people 80 to 90 years after they've heard from Zechariah and from Haggai, and God is going to confront them with his love. He's going to confront them with his character. So if you have come in today and you have wrestled at some point, whether maybe you're on a, a high spiritually right now where you are so confident of God's love and care and goodness for you today, that maybe you don't need this sermon. But if you come in today and you have faced this week maybe challenges in your life, you've faced relationships, seasons, diagnoses, um, frustrations, in your career, in your family, that have caused consternation in your soul, that have caused you to ask some questions of, where is he, and what is he doing, and is he still in charge, and does he still have a plan, and does he still love me, then this is a message that's for you. It's a particular message to God's historical people of Israel. And I want you to see how God is going to enter into their experience to remind them of his character and give them great confidence of where they stand with him. All right? So let's pray, and we'll ask God for his grace here as we jump into the book of Malachi. Father, for these few minutes, as we pause and ask for your grace We are confident of the Psalms that say that the unfolding of your word gives light. So I would pray that for myself this morning, that the things we say and the things that we see here in your word might grip our hearts in new ways. For those who are in this room who question your love and affection and kindness and providence toward us, I pray that you would blow away the fog of criticism and maybe bitterness that lives in our hearts that you would blow away the questions that nag our conscience and nag us in our spiritual life when it comes to who you are, and that we would gain a fresh understanding of your presence, of your goodness, and your character toward us. That we would learn the lessons that you would long to teach your people Israel through the prophet Malachi. That we would be able to apply them here in 2023 to our own lives and to our own challenges in a way where we would leave our time here this morning more confident of your love, more secure in our covenant relationship with you because of Jesus. And Father, would you minister to our hearts here this morning through your word and through the power of your spirit. Bless us as we come to your word to learn of you, to hear your word, to walk in your ways, and to order our lives appropriately. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Malachi chapter 1. Did you find it? You all there? Malachi chapter 1. You did it. Good job. Let's look at just the prescript of this book, which which gives you, uh, you know, any time that you open up a brand new book of the Bible, you have a tendency to read right through the intro, don't you? You kind of go, yeah, 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 get to the good stuff. Uh, But Malachi opens his his prophetic word with some very key terms that help set the stage for us to understand what Malachi has to say to his people. So watch as you just look at Malachi 1, 1 there with me. Number one, the oracle. Literally in the Hebrew, the word means to lift up or a burden. So Malachi opens his prophecy to the people by telling you that this essentially is a weighty word. It's an important word. It's a heavy word. It's a word that the prophet is going to bring to the people that matters a lot. So 
when a prophet begins to speak, if you remember how God sort of uh, navigates his relationship with his people, he always in the Old Testament navigates his relationship with his people through the word, through the prophets. In fact, as early as Samuel, where Samuel comes onto the scene and it says of Samuel that the word of God was infrequent in those days. God confronts his culture through the prophetic order of this man, Samuel, who comes into the, into the culture. Well, similarly here, we have about 80 years since the last prophet has spoken. And now the oracle or the truth from God that is a burden that rests upon the heart of Malachi and then therefore is an important word to God's people is how Malachi opens. That this is heavy. This is weighty. This is important. So it's good to know that when a prophet shows up, we should be paying attention to what the prophet has to say because he has important things to say for the people and important things in his calling as a prophet to discharge from the Lord. Number two, you have the word of who? You were the word of the Lord, the oracle of the word of the Lord. Now, the word of the Lord is, is more simply uh, put, or more meaningful, rather, than just simply God said something. Because it's right from the beginning, what Malachi does is introduce you to a character that is uh, a character that means a lot to Israel's history. Because when God calls himself the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, what he's saying and what he's uh, referring to is a relationship with his people of covenant faithfulness. In fact, when God uh, leads the people out of the Exodus and out of Egypt, God tells Moses, I used to speak to the patriarchs by the name God Almighty, El Shaddai. But now, in Exodus chapter 6, I've never spoken to the people by my name Yahweh. And on the other side of his redemption of his people out of the nation of Israel, God says, this is how we are going to relate. I am going to relate to you by my covenant faithfulness name, the Lord. So this is more than just a burden for the people. This is more than just a rebuke for their current uh, state of mind and current sinful struggles that they have. It's the word from the God who has been faithful from generation to generation. It's the word of God that has been faithful from Exodus to Malachi. So Malachi begins with this reminder that God is faithful. God does have a relationship with his people and God has been historically faithful to his people. Now finally, the final part of it, by Malachi, literally by the hand of Malachi, that God chooses to speak through this prophet Malachi and Malachi chooses to bring the heavy word to God's people who are in covenant faithfulness for him to gen for generations. That's how the book starts. We know nothing about Malachi. This is, the only, this is the only essentially mention of him in the entire book of the Old Testament. His prophecy will get quoted in other points in the New Testament, but we really don't know anything about him. We don't know what tribe he's from. We don't know what his occupation was. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know what his family line is. We don't know if he's royalty or blue collar. We know virtually nothing about him because Malachi opens his prophecy with nothing about him, but everything about the word of the Lord and who God is, which makes a very good prophet. Amen? Right? I don't care who Malachi is necessarily, but I want to hear from God. And that's how Malachi begins. Now, <clears throat> that's your prescript to the book. Uh, there's no running start in this book. There's no cultural setting. There's no um, present idolatry that requires the prophet to speak. There's no uh, essential struggle that is going on in the hearts of the people. There isn't necessarily a calling of this prophet. Anyway, there's no running start. There's no slow roll. There's no build up. There's no anything in this book other than Malachi beginning with God. So let's, before we jump into verse 2, because we know verse 2 is coming, Imagine yourself in this day and time where Malachi comes on the scene and Malachi decides to speak to you from God. Imagine, you know, like let's put it into our terms. When you get up in the morning or you, whenever you, I get up in the morning, as you all got up in the morning, uh, let's imagine you sitting down with the word of God open on your lap and you're getting ready to read of his word. Are you ready to hear from God? Do you come to God's word and open it up and go, God, would you speak to me? Because that's, that posture, I think, is important for us just to, to meditate on for a minute because we have no, no on-ramp to the prophecy. 
God enters into this prophecy very directly. He doesn't address any disobedience of the people. He addresses no cultural idolatry whatsoever. He doesn't give you any cultural things that are going on until maybe later in the book. It's as if God says, give me the microphone. You be quiet. I'm going to talk. So that's the posture we should have as we open the book of Malachi because God is about to confront us with God. See, a lot of times we want to hear what men have to say. But when God speaks, would you agree that's the most important person in the room? Well, that's where Malachi starts. God start, Malachi starts with God. Verse 2. No reproofs for failure. No identity in terms of correction. No focus on what perspective needs to change. And nothing that needs to be repented of. Verse, you ready? Verse 2. I have loved you. Now, I don't know if, you know, I'm not a prophet. I don't know if I'd start the book that way. Wouldn't you start the book with like, you know what the problem is, guys? But God doesn't choose to start the book that way. You ever read the book of 1 Corinthians? You know how many problems? Like First Corinth, Corinth, the, book, the city of Corinth has problems, if you've read 1 Corinthians at all. Paul doesn't start with the problems. Do you know that? Paul starts and he, and he, he basically, you can read it on your own, but read 1 Corinthians chapter excuse me, chapter 1 today, and just look at the joy Paul has over these people. Look at the confidence he has in the people. Look at how he says that they are not lacking any spiritual gift as they wait for Jesus. He's so confident of who they are in Christ. Now, he's got to address, you know, sleeping with your mother-in-law. He's got to address, like, a, a non-generous church. He's got to address a church that lacks on church discipline. He's got to address a church that doesn't love one another well. He's got to address a church that has bad teaching practice. He's got to do all that. But before he gets there, he starts with God. He starts with confidence. He starts with gospel. He starts with Jesus. So Malachi starts the same way. And the way the, the verb works here is that I have loved you is that in the Hebrew, it's, a, it's what's called a perfect verb. It's a verb that happens, that has ongoing implications to it. So it might be better in our, in our terminology in English to say, I have loved you, I do love you, I will love you. That my love is a singular thing you need to know about who I am. And into whatever these people are thinking, whatever these people are feeling, whatever struggles they have, God decides to remind them of God. God chooses to remind them of something that is characteristic of their relationship with him. Of his undying, his never giving up, his consistent and faithful throughout the generation's love. And that's where Malachi starts his prophecy. Before he addresses something about them, he wants his people to know something about him. So for Malachi to start here, it really gives us two things that I think we need to admit. One is that God knows that his people need to be encouraged with his truth. Be honest, how often has the love of God controlled the things that you've said and thought this week? How often has that been the highest reality in your mind and spiritual life of the total confidence you have in God's love for you? Does that have a tendency to wane in your life like it does mine? Anybody else? Anybody else feel like I, I can't access that truth from time to time? So Malachi thinks that what these people need to hear, God thinks what these people need to hear is the fact of his undying love of his people, his covenant faithfulness toward his people. One, we have a tendency uh, to forget that. But two, God knows his people need to be affirmed and encouraged by his love for them before they need to be reprimanded for their failures. Isn't that good news too? That the first thing isn't you bozos, I love you. Right? It's I love you and now we're going to deal with our relationship because God's in covenant faithfulness with his people. 
He cares about his people. He's engaged with his people. He's faithful to his people. So before we get into anything else, I think it's fair just in Malachi 1 verse 2, A, to say that God wants you to know that he loves you. Is that good news? Could we just sit and meditate on that for a little while? That God in covenant faithfulness to his promises throughout the generations at this point in 2023 and all of what he's done in your life as a result of Jesus and your faith and trust in him wants you to know that he loves you. Now, look at the next part of the verse. But you say. Now, if you're going to take notes in this passage, circle how many times the word say shows up. Because it's a conversation. Look at what people say. But you say, how have you loved us? Now, it should be enough for God to say this is how it is, right? Because he's, you know, God. But in relationship with people, do you, have you ever had relationship with people who, who you love and care for and are in uh, relationship with who see things different than you? Nobody's shaking, nobody. Okay, one. The rest of you, you're, you know, your relationships all work great. That's good to know. But you say, God says, hey, I love you. But you say, how have you loved us? Well, that's an interesting response to God, isn't it? Shh, we can't say that, those things to God. But God's people say those things to God. Isn't that interesting? That God includes his people wrestling with the fact of his love. I hope that's encouraging to you, that that's actually in your Bible, that people struggle to embrace and to make the central reality in their life God's love of them, because it was for these people and it was for us too. So God includes this retort to his love, where people say, how have you loved us? Something has happened in their life, in their time, in their experience to make them question God's love, to make God's love further than something that is more real to them than the love of God. Something has come into their perspective that makes them question God's love for them. Some pressure, some conflict, some way of life, some experience, some relative difficulty that causes God's love to be obscured in their life. So, while this retort calls into question the faithfulness that God has had with his people, I think we can admit that we've, built, we've been there, haven't we? We've felt those things. We've wrestled with that reality. We've evaluated our life by going, if God loves me, this can't be the way that God's love feels. It can't be that this situation in life is evidence of his love and care and faithfulness to me. This is evidence of your love. Now, let me tell you where this nation is spiritually. These people back in their land for the past eight decades have not had the dawning and the renewal of the kingdom that I think many of them thought would happen. In fact, if you read Haggai and Zechariah, we don't have time to turn there, but you can read them in your own time. You can see the promises that God makes of restoring his people, bringing them back into the land and the nations flowing to Jerusalem in great victory and restoration of these people. But the nation of Israel is a remnant of people. Not even all the Jews have come back. The leaders that they've had have been sparse and have had to take different trips back and forth from the nation that has been restored back into their, uh, their captors' lands. They're still ruled by a Persian governor. They don't really have authority in their own place. There's just a little bit, bitty group of them who have come back, and they're not that impressive. And for Malachi to start his prophecy with the nation of Israel, to say this is the word of the Lord to Israel, is to recall Israel at its heyday. Israel before the divided kingdom, before the idolatry, before the nations have been taken captive by the Assyrians, before Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. It's to recall God's covenant faithfulness to a people who at one time were great, who had David on the throne who had peace and safety and security. And now Malachi has the guts to say, here's the word of the Lord to Israel. And the people around would go, us? We're just, the, we're just a remnant. All of our people aren't even back. Our, our, our temple isn't as great as it once was under Solomon. Uh, and God says into that, I love you. And they go, how? 
how, how, do you, how do you love us? So these people are skeptical of God's love. They look around at what is going on in their day and time and they wrestle with God's love. They wrestle with his faithfulness because they aren't who they were. That their sins have caused them to go into exile for seven decades and they come back wounded. They come back remembering their past. They come back weak. They come back faithless. They come back with empty ritualistic worship wondering, is it worth it to serve God? And you'll see all of that here in Malachi. Malachi. So if God says, I love you, and the people says, well, how? How are you going to respond to the people? Are you going to do like Job? Like God responds to Job? Do you know how to lead out Orion? Do you know where I keep the snow? Do you know where the goats calve? Do you know who pays the water bill? Do you know who takes care of you and puts food on the table? Do you know? Are you going to do that with these people? I and mean, that's what I would do. Right? Because it's a little arrogant for God to say, I love you, and for people to go, now. Now you show me. You don't love me. Right? Do you feel that? You feel a little bit of the tension here? So what's God going to say? Here's what God's going to do. God, that impulse in our hearts, that impulse in, in Israel's heart to ask, you know, how has God loved us? What is God doing? God, God isn't doing what we thought he would do. We aren't restored like we thought we would be. Watch what he's going to do. He's going to remind them of how they started. He's going to use history to remind them of something about God. God's going to say, I love you, here's how. You say I don't. You say I haven't. You say I haven't been faithful. You say I don't. Let me show you how. Look at what God says. It's not Esau, Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. The emphasis in that sentence is on, a sentence is on Esau. It's as if God says Esau and Jacob, and everybody would say, well, we all know the story of Esau and Jacob, and then Esau and Jacob were twins. But we all, I, I had twins. There was a twin A and a twin B because I guess they weren't that creative. <laughs> twin one, twin two. We have one twin who was born one hour earlier than my second twin. So that twin is twin A. She's technically one hour older, or at least that's what they say when they go back and forth. You're the older one. You're the oldest one. Well, Jacob and Esau were twins. <laughs> Jacob and Esau wrestled in the womb and God, Rebecca um, prayed to God and God says there are two nations in your womb. And when they're born, Esau comes out, uh, Jacob tries to come out first, Esau comes out first, Esau is the firstborn, Jacob is the secondborn. And the emphasis that happens here that God is trying to, Malachi is trying to get you to see is the emphasis on what is culturally appropriate. He says, is not Esau Jacob's brother? Which means, doesn't Esau have the birthright? Isn't Esau first in line? Doesn't Esau have the honor? Doesn't Esau, in the eyes of the culture, have the rights of the firstborn? And everybody would understand that's how it works. The firstborn son has the right of the line to carry on the family. The firstborn son gets more of the inheritance. The firstborn son has more esteem. The firstborn son is the most important in the family because he's going to carry on the line. So God says, isn't Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved. Now yet is unexpected. Yet should surprise you. It would surprise the Jews. It would remind them that their history as a people comes as a result of an incredible surprise culturally. Yet, I have loved Jacob. Despite their equality and despite people's expectations, God has chosen to love Jacob. Now, the love and the hate language that you're going to have in the first part of the book here has less to do with emotional things. If you move through the Old Testament literature and when these words are used in context, they're used in context with Jacob and Leah and Rachel. Where Jacob loved Rachel, Jacob hated Leah. Which means he has a preference for one woman over another. But that's not how they're used here. Here, it has to do with God's choice. God chose to love Jacob. God chose to enter into covenant relationship with Jacob. God chose not because of who Jacob was or who Esau was, not because his parents, one, one of the parents liked one more than the other, not because one boy was better than another boy, but God chose by his own divine will, his own plan, he chose to enter into covenant relationship with Jacob, not based, Romans says, on anything that they had done so that God's purposes and election may stand. So why is this a comfort 
to God's people. Because this choice that God made of Jacob didn't depend, like I said, on the affection of his parents. Not on the cultural forces of the day that would say one son who's the firstborn receives the right to carry on the family line. It only happened and God disrupted it in an unexpected way because of God's personal choice. God decided to enter into covenant relationship with these people. So why is this the starting point for God's covenant? Why is this where God goes to back up his evidence of his love for his people? You might think he would go to Abraham and go, well, I promised in Abraham, but no, he goes to Jacob and Esau. Why? Look at verse 3. Here's the contrast. I've loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I've laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals in the desert. While Jacob is chosen, Esau is unchosen. But as they look out on their day and time, they're looking at what has happened to Esau. The people who come from Esau are called the Edomites. Now, both the Edomites and the nation of Israel have been taken into captivity. The nation of Israel for their idolatry, the Edomites as a result of their uh, hatred of their brother, their hatred of the people of Israel. And as now the nation of Israel has been regathered back into their land, Esau too is looking at the results of being overtaken by the Babylonians in their time. And God is looking out on the nation of Esau and saying that I have laid waste his hill country. I would left his heritage to jackals of the desert. Now why that's the case is very interesting biblically. And there's lots of places you can go to look at this. But historically there's been animosity between the people of Jacob and the people of Esau. So that when the people come out of the exodus, they pass through the land of Edom and the people of Edom, the brothers that they have, will refuse to let them pass through their land upon threat of death. They won't even give them a cup of water. And that as you move through the exilic literature, as the people of Israel now are conquered by Assyria and conquered by Babylon, what you discover is that the people of Edom essentially piled on to the suffering that the Babylonians and the Assyrians gave to the people of Israel. Obadiah says they stood by the way looking to cut down the fugitives. That God has a real problem when brother sins against brother. When Edom waits to destroy and attack Jacob. Keep your finger there in Malachi. Go back with me. Let me show you this from, to Ezekiel. One of the big boys here. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 35. Ezekiel 35 is a prophecy against Mount Seir, which is the mountain area of Edom. It's the land that they had been given and they had uh, been given. It's, on the, it's kind of the southeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And that they weren't conquered by the Babylonians when the Babylonians came in to destroy Jerusalem and Judah. They were conquered later on by another group of people. And they were forced out of their land. So that as Israel looks at the nation of Edom at this time, they would see through the prophecy of Malachi that God did this. God had something to say about the nation of Edom. Look at Ezekiel 35, 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you, and I will make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay your cities waste and you shall become a desolation and you shall know that I am the Lord because you cherished perpetual enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood and blood shall pursue you because you did not hate bloodshed. Therefore, blood shall pursue you. And he goes on. You can read it of yourself. But God had something to say about how Edom treated his brother Jacob. Now come back to Malachi. You with me so far? So when God says, I love you people of Israel, look at the, at the result of Edom's destruction. That is from me. Now watch this. You back in Malachi? So God judged, if you're following, God judged the nation of Israel. All right? The nation of Israel sinned, filled with idolatry, were eventually taken into captivity by the Assyrians, eventually taken into captivity by the Babylonians who conquered the Assyrians. Now we're back in this day and time where we don't have the Assyrians or the Babylonians, we have the Persians and the Medes who are in control. They're the world power of the day. 
So Israel sinned and got punished. Edom sinned and got punished. But now Israel, who's back in their land, is watching the land of Edom and recognizing that what God has done to Edom is God's choice because of what these people have done to his people. Verse 4, watch this. Here's another conversation. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins... Edom is not going to listen to the fact that their destruction is a result from the hand of the Lord. The Edom wants to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Edom wants to say that, hey, it's bad, but we can rebuild. We'll make it stronger and we'll make it better from ever. It doesn't matter what God has to say about us. It doesn't matter what has happened. We will decide to rebuild our ruins. The Lord of hosts says, now what do you think he's going to say? Here's what Edom says. We got no problem with God. Yeah, it's bad now, but we'll be able to rebuild. Look at what God says. The Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. You put a brick up, I'm going to take a brick down. You think you'll retain your land. You think by your own power, your own will, your own desires, your own wants, that you will make something of your land. I will destroy it. They may build, I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. See, just as Israel is wrestling and questioning God's love. What is Edom doing? They are questioning God's justice, aren't they? They're saying it hasn't been that, it's not that bad for us. Yeah, we've gotten, uh, we've gotten conquered. Yeah, we've been driven out of our land, but we're going to come back into our land and we're going to rebuild. That's an interesting word to use, isn't it, to the people of Israel? Why? Because what are the people of Israel doing? They're back in their land with their altar, with their temple, with their wall. What have they done? They have rebuilt. But God says here, Edom will not be given the same mercy and grace that I have given to my people. They will not be allowed back in their zip code because I will take down. Now, historically, what we know of Edom is Edom ceases to be a nation. They are gobbled up. Their people are driven out. The last mention that we have of Edom Edom is driven even further south from that southeastern portion of the Sea of Galilee. They're driven into a land now called um, Idumea. The last mention of Idumea we have is Herod who sits on the throne when Jesus comes into uh, into his ministry. And Jesus himself comes in to a ministry where he faces the last Edomite. So why does this encourage God's people? What God does by negative reinforcement is say, how do you think you're back in your land? It's because of me. How do you think you're a people restored? How do you think that I have treated my promises to send you into exile for 70 years and then to bring you back? I have been faithful. I haven't lost you. I know who you are. I know where you are. I've brought you back into the land and I guarantee to maintain my faithfulness to you where Edom will be lost as a nation. So God does it by kind of an unexpected way, doesn't he? He tells the nation of Israel, look around. Who else has my covenant faithfulness to blame for their existence as a nation? Nobody but you. I have loved you because I have loved you from the start. I have loved you and been faithful to you because you are still my people and I am still your God and I am still faithful to your promises. To my promises, your promises. You get it. <clears throat> See, if God hadn't been faithful to his promises, why would Israel return from captivity? They wouldn't. I mean, Israel, by the end of their time, was engaging in child sacrifice, just like the nations around them. There's no reason that Israel should be a nation today if not for the faithfulness of God to his covenant promises to the fathers. No reason if not for God's love that he has set upon a people who are undeserving. Now, unless you think that Jacob was better than Esau, that Esau worse than Jacob, that's not the point. Look, keep your finger there. We got, we don't, we're running out of time. Keep your finger there. Go to uh, Deuteronomy real quick. Real quick, super fast. Are you there yet? You're too slow. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7, here's what God says to the second generation of people about to go into the land that Malachi is talking about. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, 
And he lists those nations. Look at verse 2. And when the Lord God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote to them to complete destruction. You'll make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve uh, other gods. Then the anger of God would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus you shall deal with them. You'll break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their asherah, and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it wasn't because you were more in number than other peoples that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Why are you a people? Why are you here? Why are you still a people? Why have you come back to your land? It's because the Lord loves you. Because I haven't forsaken my promises to the Father. Now, back to Malachi. Let's finish it up here. Verse 5. Now, as the people look around and they see themselves, albeit not as impressive as they thought they would be back in their nation, albeit not as faithful as they ought to be, with priests who don't do the right thing, with poor sacrifices, with people who are questioning God's love, look at verse 5. God says, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the, or- beyond the border of Israel. So as God encounters these people, And he says to them, I have loved you. And they fold their arms and go, how have you loved us? The end of this conversation that points to God's sovereign electing love, his sovereign covenant faithfulness choice upon Jacob, the end of the passage completes this explanation and this entering into dialogue. And it ends with the people of God doing what? It ends with the people of God worshiping. Because any time that you deal with election and predestination in the Bible, it's never this point of consternation. When you move into the New Testament writings on this, it's never people trying to figure it out. Every single time you deal with election and predestination in the New Testament, where God sovereignly chooses, it is cause for incredible worship in the people of God. Did you hear the songs that we sung about the faithfulness of Christ to you this morning? Aren't you glad that God has not forsaken his promises? See, when we move into the New Testament literature, when Paul uses Jacob I love, but Esau I've hated, he uses it as a testimony of confidence in God's love and faithfulness to his promises. When we move into the New Testament, we don't just have God's plan coming to fruition. We have God's person who is sent to rescue and redeem his people. So that when you encounter the global reality of the church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, you're confronted with all of these epistles in the New Testament that have everything to do with Gentiles coming into relationship with God. Where Paul will write of the Ephesians and he will say, you were without God in the world and without hope. And when Paul recognizes in Ephesians chapter 1 the reality of God choosing to save, he explodes with worship. Because a lot of times you read this and and you go, well, does that mean that Edom has no hope? And the reality is, is if you read the book of Amos, you get to the end of the book of Amos and God says through Amos that there is a remnant of Edom that is used and quoted in Acts chapter 15 when God says salvation is not just for the Jew, salvation is for the Gentile as well. So that in Jesus Christ, when you move to the New Testament... You have to represent both aspects of God and his character. And this is what his people are wrestling with in the book of Malachi. They're wrestling with his love and they refuse to look at their history and his history as a faithful God. Of a God who actually keeps his promises. Which is why God demonstrates to them his judgment and his justice upon the people who have oppressed them. So all through your New Testament, as the New Testament opens to the reality of Gentiles who are far from God, who are absent the the fathers, the promises, the covenants, the history of Israel, 
who haven't experienced what the nation of Israel does here, they gain great confidence because of what Jesus has done to bring them into covenant relationship with himself. So the great mystery of the New Testament is the fact that God saves some from every single nation and tribe on earth. And when you get to the end of your Bible, there's every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue, because God's got a remnant everywhere. Amen? And that's good news for God's people. That's good news for all people. So as we close, like Israel, we're going to be tempted to evaluate God on our relative place in life, our relative situation and circumstances in life. And our challenges are to come back to the faithfulness that yes and amen, the one who fulfills all of God's promises, and to remind ourselves of what happened 2,000 years ago, just like Malachi and his people had to remind themselves of what God has been doing since Abraham. Only we have more certain and more sure confidence than they did because they didn't just have history. We have the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity who has saved us and secured us and loved us and will never stop loving us because of his faithfulness to us. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we pause at these hallowed halls of theology, confessing as we do that we have a tendency to disbelieve your love, to question whether or not you are faithful, to because of our circumstances and situations in life, to, for our perspective to be obscured and Father, I pray that we would shake that fog out of our mind and heart and that we would remember the words of what Paul says, that in Christ who loved us, we are more than conquerors. That who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is Christ Jesus who is risen and who justifies and is today interceding for us. So Father, would today be the day where we're reminded of your love? Would the love of Christ gain such a foothold in our lives that we would be able to interpret our situations and circumstances and relationships out of the confidence we have that you love sinners like us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 